I'm really pleased to welcome you tonight to tonight's presentation, How to Plan for a Successful and Secure Retirement. Tonight's presentation is brought to you by Bainbridge Community Foundation, the Merriman Financial Education Foundation, and Library U, which is a continuing ed program of the Bainbridge Public Library. Um, a few logistics before we begin. Um, tonight's presentation is closed captioned. Um, so if you, uh, so you'll see those, those, that captioning at the bottom of the screen. If you want to shut that off, you can follow the CC button, which is in your, um, in your Zoom menu, and you can, you can turn that, uh, that function off if it's distracting to you. Um, the other note is that it is voice recognition, um, closed captioning. So it's not always perfect. Um, you just have to kind of bear with it. But I hope that for anyone who might have any, uh, any hearing challenges that that's uh, going to be helpful. So we're going to begin tonight's presentation with the, the land acknowledgement for the Suquamish tribe. Paul and I and um, some of you in this, uh, some of you on this call are uh, joining us today from the Aboriginal land of the Suquamish people. And the, uh, the, the land acknowledgement statement goes like this. Every part of this soil, Chief Seattle said, every part of this soil is sacred in the estimation of my people. Every hillside, every valley, every plain and every grove has, has been hallowed by some sad or happy event in days long vanished. So as we begin tonight, we recognize that we're gathering in the Aboriginal land of the Suquamish people, the people of the clear salt water. Expert fishermen, canoe builders, basket weavers, the Suquamish live in harmony with the lands and waterways along Washington's Central Salish Sea, as they have for thousands of years. Here the Suquamish live and protect the land and waters of their ancestors for future generations, as promised by the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855. So I'm gonna um, talk a little bit about Bainbridge Community Foundation and introduce Paul, and then Paul's gonna introduce um, our, our keynote uh, tonight, Larry Swedro. And I just wanna thank uh, Larry and Paul once again for joining us today. So Bainbridge Community Foundation is a community foundation, which means that it's our job to understand what's happening in the community, to raise awareness and funds, and to make grants to those uh, that, that are meeting the needs and improving the lives of people in our community. Many of you on the call uh, from, from far away uh, have a community foundation in your own community. While grant making is one of the primary areas of focus at the foundation, our mission goes well beyond money. We seek to create a more equitable community and to give our constituents the tools to help themselves to, and to help others, which helps everyone. It's fitting then that we host tonight's presentation in partnership with the Merriman Financial Education Foundation because financial fluency is one of the most important tools with which we can help ourselves, our families, our neighbors and our community. So I'm pleased to introduce to you, Paul Merriman, Paul is a nationally recognized authority on mutual funds, index investing, asset allocation, and both buy and hold and active management strategies. Now retired from Merriman, the Seattle-based company, uh, the Seattle-based advisory firm that he founded in 1983. He is dedicated to educating investors, young and old, through weekly articles at marketwatch.com and via free eBooks, podcasts, articles, recommendations for mutual funds, ETFs, 401k plans, and more at his website paulmerriman.com. We also love to, uh, we're grateful that Paul is a member of the Board of Trustees of the Bainbridge Community Foundation and has um, really helped to spearhead our financial education series, which has been going for uh, more than six years now. So with that, I'll welcome you, Paul. Thanks for being here. Jim, thank you. And, and thanks to all of you for coming out. Many of you uh, for the second or third time. Uh, I have been uh, so pleased with the response uh, to this series. We have one more to go, and uh, we're going to be hearing from Tim Ranzetta, who is the premier uh, supplier of free curriculum to schools uh, on the all topics of personal finance. So I hope you'll join me. But tonight, Tonight, uh, I have a, a hero here uh, with me as a guest. And when I say a, a hero, uh, I personally feel that the biggest mistake that investors can make is trusting the wrong people as their source of information. And so I've talked before about one source could be Wall Street. 
Another source could be Main Street, a neighbor, uh, an associate at work. Uh, and the third source is University Street, the academic community. And what makes Larry Swedro so special to me is that he is a connection that brings together information that's used in the investment advisory and in, the, and in the all this information in here in this book about your complete guide to a successful and secure retirement. It's a fantastic book, I think. I've read every page and underlined all the things I thought would be important to, uh, to people who read it. And it's a lot of great information, but Larry has been that connection between what comes out of the academic community and what we as individual investors need to put to work. So I trust Larry Swedro, and I think the information that he offers in some 17 books that he has either authored on his own or co-authored, uh, it's, it's great material. And uh, uh, I think our library has a number of the books. It turns out you can't dictate what books are put into the library, but, uh, but anything that Larry writes, I think is worth reading. He comes from a rich background of, uh, of experience prior to joining uh, a company, uh, Buckingham. It was Buckingham Asset Management back in those days when I first knew Larry. And uh, uh, he's been for 25 years, the director of research for Buckingham. I don't know whether it's 15 billion or 50 billion that they manage, but they manage a lot of money. Uh, he has been prior to, to being with Buckingham. Uh, he was with Prudential um, Mortgage Company, Home Mortgage, I think the title. Uh, and before that was Citicorp. In all of the things that Larry did that I know about, they were all having to do with managing risk, whether it was foreign exchange risk or, or the, the, the risks of inflation and other variables that he dealt with at Prudential. Well-seasoned, well-intended, and, and filled with a ton of knowledge. Larry, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. Well, thank you very much, Paul. That was a very gracious uh, view. Uh, it's 18 bucks and uh, Buckingham advises now on more than 23 billion of assets where one of the very few, uh, maybe three or four uh, truly national firms. We have offices in almost 50 cities now. And we're also an advisor to other firms, uh, other advisors around the country. And that cumulative asset, so I'm like the director of research for all of them, we're now well over 60 billion uh, of assets, so. Well, that's great. Well, I'll tell you, I sat down uh, with the new book. I had already read uh, the previous edition and I wanted to make sure I covered all the, or many of the important topics. We don't have all night, so I've got to <laughs> zero in on the things that I think are really important to a lot of these people. And then we'll have a Q and A and they can, uh, they can, ask some of their questions, but I can't help but bring up the elephant these days in the room, which was not, not in your book as such. And that is this whole area of cryptocurrency and, and the, the Bitcoin craze and the, the, the Doge the coin and, and all of these things that represent prices oh, and coin, uh, coin, Case, coin case, coin is that base, right? base, base, excuse me. I mean, the, the value they're putting on these, I'll call them assets, with your background in the insurance industry uh, and the, the banking industry and the mortgage industry, what do you think of cryptocurrency? What is the future? And what would you tell anybody who's going to put those in their portfolio? Yeah, well, uh, let me begin by uh, having a very short discussion on forecasts. 
So I was, I'm a trained economist. That's what my background is. Uh, working for Citicorp, uh, at that time, the leading financial institution in the world, in the investment banking space especially. I sold forecasts and made them, participated in them. I ran foreign exchange and uh, interest rate trading rooms for them. Uh, and I ran uh, the same type of thing for the largest mortgage company in the country, Prudential Mortgage, and was charged of credit. Uh, I have a long background in studying financial history as well because of that. And what I can tell you is there are no good forecasters. They don't exist. Uh, that's what the research shows, at least when it comes to ec economics and markets. Uh, and therefore, the probably one of the biggest takeaways tonight should be from your audience that they ignore all forecasters. So that includes me, uh, because while I always have an opinion uh, about where the economy and markets will go, I virtually always ignore it because I know I'm no more likely to be right. I used to, here's what I used to think, Paul. When I got an economic or market forecast right, I took credit for my brilliant analysis, of course. But when I got it wrong, I blamed it on some unforecastable event that nobody could have seen. It was a surprise. And of course, that way you're a genius and you know, you're never really wrong, you're just unlucky. What I eventually, as smart people learn, that's not the right way to think about it. When I was right, I was probably lucky. And when I was wrong, I was just unlucky. And I would, uh, so I'm saying this to let you know that my forecast of what likely uh, that I foresee for Bitcoin should be taken with a very deep grain of salt because I can't tell you. I wrote a paper four years ago, which I'd be happy to send to you and you could share with the audience. I think it holds up very well today. Uh, this is a very emotional topic for a lot of people. It's almost like a religion. And if you don't agree with it, you can be you know, cancel cultured or whatever the right words are. So here's what I will say. Uh, number one, the technology of this blockchain is a tremendous advancement. Uh, and I believe within the next several years, you will have crypto currencies or blockchain currencies in every country, major country in the world, because it is a much faster and secure way to transfer data. Just think how ridiculous it is today, Paul. When I go, I've got money at several different high yield savings accounts. When they raise rates, this one is the highest yield out. So I'm online and transferring money. It could take three days to get the money there and then you can't use it for five days sometimes, depending on the institution. That's insane in the world we live in today. Bit, the blockchain technology solves all that. So very important to understand that we this craziness that we have like T2 trading with stocks. You know, you can't get your money when you sell a stock for two days. That's ridiculous. That's all going to change in the next few years. But that has nothing to do with Bitcoin. That's the technology. To me, there is literally no logic whatsoever. And I've talked to all the people who tout Bitcoin. There's not a single one who has given me any logical reason to believe that it has any value above a nominal amount. And here's the logic behind that. There is an unlimited supply, not of Bitcoin, but of Bitcoin competitors that could do exactly the same thing provide the security, the safety, the secrecy, all of those things. And basic economics tells you when you have an unlimited supply of something, the price should be asymptotically close to zero. So my view is this is could very well be the biggest bubble in history, making the Tula bubble bubble, <laughs> Tula bowl bubble look like uh, you know nothing. Or it might turn out to be that it goes on to be worth, you know, 100,000, 200,000 or more, because it's a story 
And if people believe enough people believe in it, that's what it has value. It has zero intrinsic value. And there are already uh, hundreds, if not thousands of competitors. So I personally believe that this thing likely, my mind is, heads towards zero. But I could be dead wrong, and I'm very humble about my forecast. <laughs> so. Well, I, I appreciate that, Larry. And uh, I was interested. I, I saw a couple of guys in a discussion uh, on a podcast, uh, a Zoom podcast, and they're very, very knowledgeable and very up and supportive of, uh, of the cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin. And both of them, during the conversation, admitted they didn't really understand it. <laughs> and, and this is what I find so interesting is finding the people who truly understand uh, what Bitcoin is and what is that underlying value. Well, now let's get on. Thank you for taking Well, the hang on. I'll give you one other just point. Okay. Uh, this is, a, I'll mention this because it's a value. There's only two bloggers who I read everything they write, and they're not really related necessarily to investing. One, I think, may be the smartest guy in the world. Uh, uh, Oh, uh, now, uh, oh, it's just escaping me. Uh, Tyler, Ka Tyler Cowen. It's this age thing, Paul. Names, uh, you know, camera. <laughs> Tyler Cowen, he has a blog. It's absolutely fantastic. You want to learn about the COVID and the science and the medicine and how dumb our CDC and FDA have been and anything else you want to learn about. He knows more about everything than anybody I've ever met. I, I, read everything he writes religiously. The other is John Cochran. He uh, has a blog called The Grumpy Economist. Uh, and he, I believe, is definitely our leading financial economist. Uh, he was chairman of the Finance Association, for example, uh, and, and stuff. So, uh, and he, he was asked about Bitcoin and I was felt very good. It made me feel smart for a change when he said almost exactly the same thing about Bitcoin as me. So at least I'm in good company if I'm wrong. That's great. Well, let's talk about a, 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 a very serious topic. In your book, you, you talk about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You change it. It's the four horsemen of the retirement apocalypse. And, and I mention a fifth, too. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Would you just uh, talk about those? Because those are the, the serious concerns, uh, or, or, or certainly should be, for people doing long-term planning. Yeah, this is really an important uh, subject, and that's why it's right up front in the book. Uh, very common mistake that investors make. And I, I wanna make this point. Uh, the people on this call, I'm sure are highly intelligent, uh, but they may also be ignorant. And, it, and I don't mean ignorant in a pejorative sense. I think I'm fairly intelligent. I graduated number one from one of the top MBA programs in the country, but I'm totally ignorant about nuclear physics. My wife and three daughters tell me women is another subject that I'm ignorant about. Uh, but, you know, so ignorance is not a negative term. It just means you have lack of knowledge. Smart people can be ignorant about lots of things. The sad part is, I think one of the great tragedies in America is, despite the importance of money and investing, uh, and it's not money itself, of course, it's meaningless, but what money can buy for you financial security, a nice retirement, good education for your kids, travel, whatever is important to you. I think outside of your family, your health, and for some people, perhaps their religion, money is the next most important thing. And unless you get an MBA in finance, not just an MBA, it's a virtual certainty, not 100%, that you've never taken a single course in capital markets theory. So how are people supposed to get educated? I thank God that there are people like you and Bill Bernstein, uh, and I hope I'm contributing in my way as well, to try to make up for the lack of education provided by our education system. Because 
most of what happens is, is they bring in some stockbroker, maybe they donated some money to the school, and they teach them all the wrong things, not what we know the science of investing based on the academic research says. So one of the mistakes that people make, and it, it's very easy to see why that would be the case, is they look at historical returns for asset classes, stocks and bonds as example, and then just extrapolate that into the future and assume that will be the case. So it, why is that a problem? Because it's completely nonsensical. Uh, you have to look at how returns were earned and what caused them. So for example, uh, I'm just gonna pull out a little uh, book I have to read a little data here. Uh, if you look at US stock returns up to say 19, uh, right after World War II, uh, so 1949, so we had 29, about a little over 30 years of data, stock returns were 6.8%. Now, if you looked at that return and projected it, that was probably likely to be a vast understatement because we had gone through a depression in World War II, and now the Korean War was a possibility, and people were not, and valuations were likely much lower than that you would think in the long term. And then valuations went way up, from then until 99. So by 1999, the return to the market was now 11.3%. So somebody looking at that data would say, I should expect stocks to get me 11.3%. That too was nonsensical because in 1949, the average PE was less than 10 and it was probably in the high 30s or maybe 40 by the end. So valuations went way up and you can't get the same returns. Most of that excess return occurred not because the profits were much greater, but because valuations went way up, the PE went up. And so that's a real problem. People should have been expecting much lower returns going forward. And that's in fact what happened. Same thing is true of bonds. You know, if you look at long-term returns to say a five-year treasury, the number is probably something like 5%. But today the five-year treasury is about 1%. So you can't get 5% unless rates collapse. You know, that's possible. But even then, then the future returns will be even lower. So what I did in the preface to the book is to point out a big mistake that I see even many professional advisors make is rely on the history and not consider where valuations are so you could see how they impacted past returns. Now, many of the people on this call, Paul, I think are from the ones I could see are our generation. So they began investing probably around the 80s, you know, got out of college and they're paying off their debt and saving for a down payment and the 80s come and you know they've now got enough money to invest maybe they're in their 30s now uh, or so and that what led to the, a, a tremendous returns if, because the PE ratios were at six as we entered that era yeah. and today they're in their 20s and bond yields at that time were in their teens and today they're under two. So you had a powerful tailwind at your back. And it, the typical 60-40 portfolio that we hear mentioned as endowments typically use and recommended for a lot of people, at least till they get near retirement. That portfolio historically, if you go back to the 20s, earned about eight and a half percent. But from 80s on, it was over 10. Now, there literally is virtually no way you can get that today because PEs are much higher and bond yields are low. In fact, most financial economists do what we do. They forecast returns based on today's valuations. And if you have PEs, let's just round it. It's even worse than I'm about to say. But PE of 20 for the market, 
That gives you an earnings yield. So you invert the PE to make it E over P of 5%. That's the best predictor we have of future real returns. So add say 2% for inflation, you can now expect stocks to get seven, not the historical 10% plus they've earned over the last almost 100 years now. And bonds can only get you 10, let's use the 10 year, that's about 1.5%. So if you're 60% getting seven, it's a little over four, and 40% getting one and a half, that's 60 basis points, you're around four and a half percent. That's half almost, a little bit more than half of the 95 year return. And it's only 40% of the last 30 years or so. Uh, but then, people but then, are going to be disappointed. Can I just interrupt for, for a second then? Yeah. Uh, obviously, we have a challenge in trying to predict. I mean, predicting is difficult under any condition. Right. But, but now we're talking about predicting using, in an essence, a, a formula approach right. that you're comfortable with. What is, what is the resolution or the solution or the steps that people should be taking that are actually within their control to do something about that? I mean, it's, I guess one thing they have to do is to reconsider what they have in their plan for a return. What's, yeah. what's beyond that? Yeah, so let, let's come back to this. Let's just use that as a baseline forecast. Let's say a typical 60, 40 portfolio might get four to 5%. Let's just use that. The only right way to think about that forecast, Paul, and here's another mistake that people make, is they tend to think of that in a deterministic way. I'm going to get four and a half percent. The thing is the only right way to think about that is to create like a bell curve and that four and a half percent is the median estimate with half of the possible future universes or to use a Star Trek term, an alternate universe where you'll get more and half less. If you get lucky, maybe the returns are six or seven. If you're unlucky, maybe they're two or even negative like Japan has had for the last 30 years for stocks virtually no return. That's possible. And all plans must incorporate those full spectrum, not just the median. So first thing that people need to do is to uh, think about how much they need in retirement. And when they do that, you want to make sure you really need things, not want or desire, right? Uh, and separate those two because the greater the need you create, then the bigger the pile of money you'll need to retire. And that means you have to take a lot more risk, which may not be appropriate for your situation. So that's number one. You also have to consider, here's another problem. You have to consider that once you retire, you have what's called sequence risk, which we talk about in the book. So I'll give you a great example of sequence risk. When you're in the accumulation phase, bear markets are good because you get to buy more at lower prices. People don't think of it that way, but when you're in, as long as you remain employed, when you're in the accumulation phase, you should always be rooting for bear markets. Instead, people are happy watching their values go up not realizing that means when they add more money, that future money is gonna earn lower returns. So th that's a problem. But when you are in retirement, now if the market goes down, you withdraw money and that money can never recover, even though the market does, because you've spent it. So a great example is if you were unlucky enough to retire in 1973, I can tell you this, if you, even though the market returned 10% from 73 through last year, if you, and that meant 7% roughly after inflation, if you took out that 7% every year, and you know, for the 50 years, you got 7% real, 
and you're going to adjust it for inflation, even with that certainty, nine years later, you were bankrupt. And the reason was the market crashed in the first two years, over 40 percent, inflation soared, and you had to withdraw a lot more money. And when you did that, your portfolio crashed and you went bankrupt. It's another real problem why you have to become more conservative when you enter retirement, even though we're expecting to live a lot longer. So a second to die life expectancy of the typical American couple, 65, is 90. And that means half of the time, one of the two will be alive. So you literally have to plan for at least 30 years. You have to worry about sequence risk. So people are living longer and, uh, and return outlook is not as good. So that pile of money earning lower returns, unfortunately, has to last longer. And another problem that we face is as we age, medical costs go way up, particularly because the risk of Alzheimer's dramatically increases once you pass 75. So if you're lucky enough to live long enough, your risks are there and the costs to deal with that can drain most people's portfolio unless you're a multimillionaire, could very quickly deal. So that's another problem. And then the fifth horseman that I mentioned is Social Security, while not bankrupt, is if nothing changes, and now I think it's 12 more years, we'll only be able to pay out 75%. So I think people should not plan on getting more than that. Uh, and so that's another risk that we have. And now you got the, well, the budget deficit problem. So there's a lot of things people have to worry about. So here's what I tell people. If you're able and willing, keep working as long as you can. So you protect your portfolio, you don't withdraw from it. Secondarily, make sure you keep enough equity risk in the portfolio and don't get too conservative because that portfolio may have to last 35 years. Uh, and keep your spending to the things that are really important, which are experiences and not, you know, things. Uh, no one, you know, gets on their tombstone, he died with the most toys. It's you know, was I, you know, I hope when I pass on, you know, people say he was a good husband, a good father, a good friend. And the best thing that I do with my time, I can't imagine anything better than sitting with my grandkids and playing games with them, taking a walk with my wife around the lake in the park, uh, traveling, those things, not spending money on things that don't really move the needle in terms of the quality of your life. You know, Larry, in your conversation about the reality of likely returns, and by the way, this has been a warning that has been on the table for many years. Uh, we can go back to, to uh, even after the decline of 2008, they were still saying count on lower earnings in the future. But, but it seems to me there's a part of your book that has to do with selecting a financial advisor. Mm -hmm. I can see a conflict of interest here as an investment advisor if I get too tough with people because you're talking tough, okay? You're saying things people don't want to hear. Another right. advisor maybe charges a little more money even, but he's got a, or she's got a better story because advisors do paint pictures and they're going to, they try to paint pictures that they think the client is going to be happy with because they're looking to work with them for the rest of their life. It isn't an evil thought. It isn't, it just maybe not, may not be a very educated thought. And, and so uh, one of the things that I've encouraged people to do is, is save twice as much as you think you need. <sighs> which is basically what you're suggesting at some level. Well, uh, I, would, I, would say th I would say this, Paul, uh, you can't take the money with you. At least I haven't met anybody who's been able to claim that they could. Uh, and therefore you wanna spend it, you know, and enjoy your life. That's what, you know, hopefully in good ways. 
Uh, so you don't want to be so conservative, but definitely, you know, it is safer given the risks that we have uh, here and the potential for severe bear markets, given valuations, the budget deficits that we're facing, uh, you know, and no end in sight here. And I will add this, there are, are a series of papers, I just wrote up a piece on this, and like everything else, it's not my opinion. I'm citing academic literature. There are four papers I think I cited that point out that the research shows that once the debt to GNP gets in excess of, depending on the paper, somewhere to 85% to about 115%, then economic growth is negatively impacted and we're getting near the top of that range already uh, and no end in sight for huge deficits. And we haven't even heard the next infrastructure plan and the next, you know, I would be very concerned that that's a risk because if you don't get strong economic growth, you can't justify 23 PEs. The only way you can justify that is you get strong economic growth that leads to rapid earnings growth. But the research shows that when the budget deficit gets above that, economic growth is negatively impacted. Uh, so that creates at least another risk. We don't know what will happen. I can't tell you what will happen, uh, but we know the research shows when you look around the world, when countries' debt to GDP ratios get to those levels, their economic growth was negatively impacted. So that's another, we might call that the sixth Hoffman of the retirement apocalypse. So, so one of the questions that comes to mind when, when somebody knows as much as you do about all of these factors and the factors, let's say, and let's say you had been 60% in equity uh, and, and if you really get negative, feeling negative, or maybe realistic about these things, you you change your asset allocation. I think you believe in buy and hold, correct? Uh, well, almost. Uh, you're missing two other important points. Buy, hold, rebalance, and tax manage. <laughs> okay, great. And that's all in the book, by the way. I mean, that's there's some great stuff in there on all of those topics. Yeah, and, and Paul, let me add this, uh, that the only time you should change your equity and bond there and other asset allocation is when any of your assumptions that went into your plan about your ability, willingness, and need to take risk. And we go in great detail to help people figure out their yeah. ability, willingness, need, giving them tables and other things. And rules that's of thought. a terrific part of your book, by the way. That's Thank really you. A, and so a, that's a key. Part. Now, I may think that at least U.S. equity returns are, are likely to be much lower than historical. I would tell you emerging markets and international are about their long-term average valuations, which means their expected returns are much better. And given basically zero interest rates, their premium above that, you know, the, you know, the safe benchmark may even be higher than historical. So there is some good news for those who avoid a home country bias. And to me, we point out in the book, U.S. is half the global market. My view is you should have half of your money outside the U.S. And most people, the average American only has 10%. Part of it due to recency bias, because the U.S. has been the big outperformer for the last 10 years. But there have been many decades where it dramatically underperformed. 2000 to 2009, it underperformed, especially from 2000 to 2005, was massive underperformance. Uh, and it underperformed in the 70s and 80s. So, so... Asset allocation is a major topic in your book. Yeah, I don't uh, change my asset allocation based upon my view of stock returns. That's what I wanted to get at. Uh, uh, so that is that is the commitment of a buy and holder. This is why buy and hold, I think, is so difficult. Is because our emotions are, look at all these reasons why things look risky. And maybe I 
I should be changing and putting more money into fixed income because it looks like the market's likely to go down. You've implied that. You've implied that strongly, and yet, yet the. Well, I'm not saying the market's going to go down. I'm saying that the expected future returns are much lower. The market could just generate, just hypothetically, seven percent a year for the next twenty years. Every year, it's also possible yeah. that valuations go back to their historical average, and you, and or worse, because you get high inflation and much lower economic growth. That's but the possible point is, too. The point is, is that your approach and and what you recommend to others is truly a buy and hold approach. It, it you're not bobbing and weaving as you see things coming and going, yeah. and that is difficult uh, for for people. Yeah. So let's just talk about yeah. So let me say this, Paul. Yeah, let, just one last point on this. What this low uh, interest rate environment and high PE environment means is that you have to adapt to a world of much lower future expected returns. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you should try to time the market. It doesn't mean stocks will collapse. They may even go up. I remember uh, Alan Greenspan in December, I think it was 96 or 97, I forgot the year, Markets are irrationally exuberant. The PE of the S&P was very high, 50% higher than its average at about 23. And then of course, the next three years were the best three years the market had seen, and he looked dumb. Eventually, he turned out to be right, but he was three. So that's why you can't or should not be in the timing game. You cannot, even though the market forecasted lower expected returns, the market can ignore your forecast. So give us give us some information about taking money out of our investments uh, in retirement. Uh, yeah, in the withdrawal phase. Yes. Uh, so uh, some we have a whole chapter on withdrawal strategies, uh, and uh, so I I will tell you that is uh, the most dangerous area or time for retirees is in the first, say, six to 10 years, mm -hmm. because once you get past that, if the markets have done well, you've built up a bigger nest egg and you have a shorter time, it has to last, so right. you're in good shape. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you get, if you retire in 73 or 2000 or 08, you could be in serious trouble, uh, and maybe the next one is around the corner, uh, we just don't know. And the reason is the sequence risk. So you have to become more conservative, unfortunately, uh, because of that risk of sequence uh, risk. So that's really important. And don't take more risk than you can stomach because, uh, let me give you an example. So let's say you think emotionally, the worst you could handle is a 20% drop in your assets. Well, we know the market in 08 dropped 60%. Well, if you don't, now the bonds, if you own safe bonds like you and I recommend and not things like junk bonds, they went up. So if you were 60, 40, 40% 40 of your portfolio goes up 10%, that's good. But 60% dropped 60%, that's 36% hit. Maybe your portfolio is down 30 and you said you could only take 20. So you can't be 60% because when that happens, number one, almost certainly you won't be able to sleep well. You won't enjoy your life and life's too short not to enjoy it. But mm -hmm. even worse, if you don't panic and sell, all right, but it's possible you will. And now once you sell, the odds of you being able to buy again are close to zero. Uh, the research says we tend to panic because we can't take any more losses. In 09, in March, the world looked like it was gonna get much worse. In fact, the unemployment rate kept going up through the end of the year from uh, all the way up to 10%. The economy was still in a recession in the second quarter of 09. There was no green light. 
And if you were a Republican, you were worried about President Obama and what these liberal Democrats would do, and you were more likely to sell. That's what the research showed. Uh, we let our political biases even. Democrats were more likely to believe that uh, they would solve the problem. They were less likely to panic. There's another lesson for our listeners. Don't let your political views bias your investment decisions. So you have to look, and I give a table in the book, if a 20% drop is all you can stomach, then maybe you only could be 40% equities. And then you have to figure out how long I have to work. When can I retire? Maybe I have to cut my spending down. Maybe I should consider moving to a lower cost of living area because that's better than taking the risk and then the bear market shows up and now you panic and now you have to worry, maybe I'll end up eating cat food. We don't want that. <laughs> so, so Larry, one of our viewers has, uh, and you, you have a great chapter on this, uh, has asked the question about maybe one way to, to work through this and uh, uh, get a little better return, uh, immediate return is to get a single premium uh, annuity, immediate yeah. annuity. Uh, and and uh, I think that there are a lot of people that that is probably going to be the right thing. Maybe not, probably not for their whole uh, portfolio, but certainly for part of their portfolio. Do you want to talk a little bit about the single premium uh, annuity? Yeah, sure. Happy. Uh, this is, uh, we have a whole chapter on that. And another interesting not as good, but it's at least worth understanding. I have a chapter on reverse mortgages, which can be another option that can be deployed for those who have paid down their house, which many retirees have done. And they don't, they want to retire and live in that house with dignity, not have to go to some nursing home or something. So the house can act there. So there's a whole chapter uh, on the uh, in the book on reverse mortgages as a pop. That's an expensive alternative, but it's at least worth considering uh, there. So let's talk about annuities. Annuities is an insurance contract that pools longevity risk. That's what you're buying. You're buying insurance against the possibility that you will live longer than expected. Now, everybody on this call knows that when you buy insurance, you are likely losing money. The insurance company is not in the business of selling you insurance, so they lose money. They're taking risks, whether it's fire insurance, earthquake insurance, they're gonna, they have costs to originate it, the salesman, the underwriting, and the expected losses, and they want a risk premium on top of that to earn their profit and their cost of capital. So whenever you buy insurance, you should expect to be losing money. But we buy it because it's a risk we don't want to bear because the consequences of not having the insurance are far worse than the cost. So for example, we buy car insurance, but we don't buy insurance for oil changes. We buy homeowners insurance, but we may have a $1,000 or $2,000 deductible because we can budget for that. But we don't want the risk of that possibility of my home being destroyed and I'm out, you know, whatever that value of the home is. Annuities basically work in that the insurance companies know what the average life expectancy of all, say, 65-year-olds are, and they will price that risk and they also consider that the people who are going to buy annuity are self-selecting. They're going to be healthier because the people who have smoked and you know, may be overweight and diabetic, they say, hey, I don't want to buy long term. I'm likely to die early anyway. Yeah. And so they understand there's negative selection against them. So you have to understand that already in the pricing is that now. What annuities do is it reduces your risk that you will live longer than expected because you're gonna get that payment for as long as you live or second to die if you designate that for, for a married couple. 
So you get what's called mortality credits. The people who die early subsidize because they're not going to get their payments. Say you buy it, the insurance company expects you to last to age 80 on average. You die at 70. Those payments between 70 and 85 are available to give to the people who live longer. So they're priced in that way. You get mortality credits. And those mortality credits, once you're past about age 75, exceed anything else that's a risk-free investment. And you can't duplicate that by, say, building a bond portfolio, okay? And it's, you're now in the stage where you overcome the costs and the profit margins of the insurance company. I bought an annuity for my mother-in-law that started paying at age 85. Because we budgeted, we knew she had enough money to last to age 85. If she died earlier, so what? We didn't need to inherit it. We wanted to protect our assets. And so what I tell people is don't ever buy an annuity that starts paying immediately. Budget for your life expectancy. That's covering the period that you should be self-funding. Then you buy an annuity to protect on the tail end, maybe past age 85. That means you can probably put up a very much smaller fraction, maybe 15 or 20%, depending upon when you start the annuity, giving you a lot more liquidity and flexibility. Think of it, it's like the deductible on your home, or we don't buy the insurance for the oil change. Budget for that. So annuities can be good, and they're really good to help people who are on the margin. Uh, some people use a safe harbor withdrawal rule of say 4% of their portfolio. So if you had a million dollars, you could take 40,000 the first year adjusted for inflation. I'll mention, I think that's too aggressive now for the, because of the reasons of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Something more in the order of three to three and a half, I think is a better rule. But your risk now is you have to live not 30 years, but maybe 40. You want to protect that. So you hedge that risk by buying that annuity. Now, there is a bit of a problem here because there are no good annuities that give you a good inflation hedge. Uh, there are some that will provide inflation up to 3% a year, and but that's about it. So you're putting up this capital and you're running an inflation risk for the next 35, 40 years, maybe. Uh, so that's another reason to limit the purchase to the deferral period and not put all of the capital. Uh, I'm a big fan for people who are on the margin and have to worry, well, if I live longer, I might not have enough. Annuities can be good uh, to do that, but they should be fixed annuities, not indexed annuities, things with big sales load, looking at equity risk, and use the deferred annuities. And I'd recommend reading the chapter in the book, because I know this might be a bit technical for a lot of people on the call, but the chapter will walk you through that. That's great. Uh, we have another question that, that I wanted to bring up uh, having to do with uh, adding value to the portfolio. Uh, and I'm, we have talked in some of the other presentations about small versus large and value versus growth and whatnot. But from your viewpoint, Larry, what do you think? How much value do you have to add to a portfolio to benefit from that, from that premium? And I don't want to forget to ask you this along with that. What are your expectations for future premiums on value and small cap? Yeah, well, we could spend the next uh, 24 hours uh, on this subject. For those of you interested, I wrote a book called Your Complete Guide to Factor-Based Investing and goes through all of the academic literature. We cite 100 and I think it was six papers in that book. And so it's not just small in value. There are other factors, including profitability, something called quality. For stock, for bonds, you have term risk and credit risk. And then there's something called a low volatility premium. Interestingly enough, at least on a risk adjusted basis, 
lower volatility stocks have generally outperformed higher volatility. Although it's really in that case, the highest volatility stocks have been god awful. Uh, and the rest of the market has done very well. So if you just avoid what's now been the best stocks in ever these bubbles, the high volatility, you're likely to do better. Let me talk about value and small. So here we have the academic research shows just like the stock market is a factor, it's called market beta. It's earned a premium historically of about 8% a year above treasury bills. And most people believe, of course, that's a risk premium. It's not a free lunch. Uh, stocks crash. We had a 90% drop in the Great Depression. We've had 60% drops just in 08, 09. And we've had a bunch of 30, 40% drops. It's painful. Uh, and that's why stocks are priced to have high returns because people hate those risks, especially because they correlate with your labor capital. So they tend to show up at the time you get laid off and now you're in deep trouble because you have to sell stocks to put food on the table and you can't recover. The same logic has been found for small stocks, which intuitively are riskier than large companies for a variety of reasons. So they have outperformed on average, but it's just the tendency. There are long periods when they underperform and value stocks have outperformed growth stocks by fairly wide margins over the long term. But you have to have the discipline to stay the course because these things, factors can go through very long periods of underperformance that is nothing more than random. And people don't understand. They think when it comes to judging the performance, in fact, well, I'm gonna go on the record and say, this may be the worst mistake because it's the most common maybe that investors make and when it comes to judging the performance of an investment strategy they think three years is a long time five years a very long time and 10 years is infinity any good financial economist would tell you 10 years is noise when it comes to risky assets and you should ignore it or don't invest because you'll make mistakes let me give you this example the market in the form of the S&P 500 has gone through three periods of at least 13 years where it underperformed totally riskless treasury bills. And the longest was 17 years from 66 to 82. And from 2000 to 08, they underperformed T-bills by more than 60%. That's eight years. Do you give up on stocks because of eight years? How long do I wait? Many people panicked and sold and missed out on one of the great bull markets. So when value stocks, which have dramatically outperformed over the long term, went through a period from basically October of 16 through March of 2020, that was the worst drawdown ever. By the way, there were three other periods, Paul, where we had similar bad periods of value. Not really long, but bad. All right, not like stocks where you had three or 13 years, but more typical three to five years, okay? Were in the bubble of, nine, of the late 90s, the bubble of the nifty 50 in the 60s when you had the Xeroxes and Coca-Colas trading it all at 50 or more PEs, and digital equipment and all those stocks. And the other time was the roaring 20s. And in each case, Value did poorly for that period when we had these bubble and growth manias. And the next period, value went on to spectacular returns. And I think that's what's likely, not certain now, because value today is cheaper than it was in 1999. And from 2000 to 05, we had the biggest value premium ever. But if you can't stay the course, because three years makes you abandon value, then you shouldn't own any. Now, my portfolio is 100% small value. I'm a believer in the evidence and the science. And one big benefit of doing that is small value stocks, let's say we think historically have outperformed the market by let's say 3%. That allows me to hold a lot lower equities overall because the equities I own 
have much higher expected returns. So historically, a portfolio that say 40% small value and 60% bonds has had very similar returns to a 60-40, but market-like S&P portfolio. But the 60-40 S&P portfolio had much bigger drawdowns, like the worst years might be down 30%. For the 4060, the worst years might have been down 10. And that's because you have a much bigger safe bond portfolio, which tends to do really well. So that helps cuts the sequence risk, the tail risk, the risk that you panic and sell. But I would tell people that's only right for people who can ignore periods of three, five, or 10 years because it's going to happen. And you're going to have to live if you're 65 to so say 30 years of that. So you're going to live through two, three, four of them and have to ignore that noise. But the same thing is true of stocks. We've had three super bear markets in just the last 20 years. That's once every seven years. So that means if you've got 30 years to plan for, you should plan on four more of those. And you better be able to stay the cost because you will be tested. Almost certainty you will get big bear markets. That's just the nature of the world we live in. So there's no right portfolio. I always believe the right one for you is the one most likely that you'll stick with. But for retirees especially, I personally believe if you can stand the heat in the kitchen, a highly tilted value portfolios are far superior because they cut that tail risk and let you sleep well. You know, we have a lot of great uh, uh, questions here. By the way, we have some questions like, here's what are PEs? Uh, uh, oh, Paul, by the way, while I think of it, I wrote a book on this subject, just of what we discussed, called Reducing the Risk of Black Swans that yes. shows you the science and the evidence behind this strategy of what we call a high tilt, but low beta portfolio. And PE, of course, is price to earnings ratio. So you take a company's price, let's say it's 40, and they earn $2 a share, the PE is 20, and that would give you an earnings yield. One over 20 would be 5%, and that's the best predictor we have of future returns in real terms. So you would say a 20 PE stock has a 5% expected real return. If you believe say inflation is 2%, then you should project your portfolio would earn about seven, but that's the mean of a distribution, which is why, and we have a chapter on this in the book, we run Monte Carlo simulations for every client before we implement any asset allocation to show them their odds of success and what can happen in thousands of different scenarios. Will your plan hold up in the left tail if the really bad ones come up? And how well will it do if the good side shows up? Yeah, that, that's great. And, and by the way, we've had uh, a question in here uh, that is about the Monte Carlo and uh, the effectiveness, the, the meaning meaningfulness of Monte Carlo. You want to just talk briefly about, uh, not too deep, but because we don't have right. a lot of time, but right. Monte Carlo study, what is it and and how reliable is that information? Right. Well, Monte Carlo's uh, analysis, what it does is it takes, let's say you think that stocks are going to return 7%, and you look at the historical volatility and it's 20, it will then run, in our model, we, will, we run 3,000 different alternate universes. It will spin out using that, those two statistics and show you here's 3,000 possible different universes over the next 30 years. So you may end up, the mean is gonna be that 7%, but it might be there's a 40% chance there'll be more than eight and a 20% chance will be more than nine and a 5% chance will be more than 10. But there's also a 40% chance it'll be less than five and a 30% chance it'll be less than three and a 20% chance it'll be less than zero. And we look at all these scenarios to make sure your plan 
with a certain withdrawal rate can leave you alive and still, when you die, you'll, you'll still have some assets. You won't run out of money before you die. So that's what a Monte Carlo does. What's really important to understand is the Monte Carlo will give you not the odds of success, it will give you, you an estimate of the odds of success based upon your estimates of return. So it's only as good as the data. But we do have tools that tell us what are the best predictors. They're not perfect. That's why we run Monte Carlos to look at different alternatives. And you should use that science by looking at current valuations to tell you what expected returns are. And then make sure you don't look at the point estimate, but consider all the distributions. And you might say, well, I like this 40, 60 portfolio. Uh, and then I match that with a three and a half percent withdrawal rate. And that gives me a 92% chance of success. Then you build a plan B to deal with the 8% chance of failure that says, okay, if that risk shows up, say, oh, wait, happens, I'm gonna give up the trip to Europe uh, every year. I'm gonna delay buying a car every three years. I'll make it every 10 years. I'll move uh, to Kia, you know, from New York City down to Destin, Florida, whatever it might be. So you write that plan down when you're not in the emotions of the market crashing, it's well thought out, considered, steps you can actually take. So it's a tool, just like a racing car in the hands of Mario Andretti, it's a great tool. In the hands of a drunk teenager, it's garbage and deadly. Right. So so a part of your book I found really uh, not fun reading, interesting, uh, kind of heartfelt, that's this family, this, this money and family. Uh, just take a second, if you will, Larry, and because uh, I had not seen that in other books that you had done, and I haven't read them all. But talk about the money and family and the mission statement. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, I got lucky in my life, uh, took a big risk, left the job, took a huge pay cut, but got a piece of equity. Turned, luckily, it all turned out well. Uh, and I was able to basically retire if I wanted to over 30 years ago. Uh, and I sat down and I talked to a friend who recommended I read this book, Preparing Your Heirs, uh, which is how do you educate your children? Because one day they're going to inherit this money and how do they deal with wealth, et cetera. And I learned a great deal from that. And ever since then, I've been trying to preach to others to make sure that they take the time to sit down with their family. My kids, since they were teenagers, know everything about the family's assets. They know where all the bank statements are. They know who our advisors are, who's the attorney, the CPA. They know what they're going to inherit and when. Uh, and we created a family foundation because I wanted to pass on my values. And they vote every year on where we give money to charity and they know they're not getting our IRA money because that's, it'd be dumb to inherit it. They'd end up paying like 85% taxes on it by the time you're done with estate taxes and income taxes and everything else. Uh, so we're gonna donate that to my foundation and they will then have to spend that money. So that hopefully keep my three kids together and they could even pass it on to their grandkids. So you wanna prepare your ass for wealth, teach them what values you have uh, we, we, uh, we think it's a great idea to write this family wealth mission statement and we give you a sample one. What's the purpose of the money? Why did you save it? What did you want it to do? Uh, and so it's a sin in this country that money is such a taboo ta subject in many families. One of my son-in-laws, he literally doesn't know anything about his parents' estates. They don't know where the money is what bank accounts, they wouldn't be able to find it even if somebody died and that's just their parents, that's the way that generation may have been brought up. That, you know, that's really, I think, a, a crime. It's a disservice to the kids. Uh, so I, we wrote this chapter, 
uh, to help people have those difficult subjects. It's another thing a good financial advisor, a true wealth advisor could do is help you run family meetings. And that should be part of what they do, which is why, by the way, I tell people you should never hire a money manager, you should hire a wealth manager who integrates the investment strategy with estate planning, insurance, um, and everything else in your life, whether it's retirement planning or passing on values, educating your kids, uh, reverse mortgages, when to take Social Security, all the topics we cover in the book. Uh, and most of the time, those advisors charge the same as people, or maybe even less than people who are just managing money for you. So, so Larry, another uh, great area in the book is the conversion of Roths, uh, IRAs to Roths. Um, and uh, um, I, I just want to check with you. Uh, uh, I've always taught young people that uh, we don't know the future of taxes. And to the extent that you can get all the money you possibly can into a Roth, what it basically does is it forces you to save more money than you would likely have saved it had you gotten the refund. I mean, that's probably the bottom line for most people. And that the Roth is probably the best estate planning tool that I know of. Uh, and but but what's your what what's your feeling on the Roth? You give a ton of information on that in the book. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, retirement planning, uh, a, a 401k, traditional and Roth accounts are great tools. We explain when a Roth is better and when a traditional 401k. It's a very simple one. If you think your tax rate is going to be high now and low when you retire, then you should put money in the traditional IRA. If you think it's reverse, you want to do it the other way. Now, what's really important to understand is we're in this problem that I mentioned earlier about massive government deficits. I think everyone, you know, no matter what they're telling you today, we're only going to raise taxes on people on 400,000. That's just, there's just not enough money there. I think we're likely to see higher tax rates because those budget deficits are unsustainable. So uh, one good strategy, since we don't know, is you diversify and you can own both a traditional and a regular if you don't know. If you think rates are going up and you may have to pay more uh, or in retirement, it'll be more than a Roth is a, a better asset. It's also better because it avoids RMDs, you're not required. So if you don't need the money, you can continue to grow in effect tax-free forever, if you will, or until you take it out. Here's one big mistake that and Roth conversions have been a great tool, especially in years, let's say like 2002, 08, 09, maybe 2020. If you run a business, your business got hit, your income is way down. Or maybe you're in what we call a blackout period, uh, which is this. You retire at 65, and we tell you, don't take your Social Security until 70, or maybe even a little later now, because that's the highest risk-free rate of return you can get if you expect to live long, normal, healthy. Better off drawing down your taxable accounts, living off of that, and every year your payment goes up 8% a year and you're buying longevity insurance, of course, because your pool of money will get bigger, right? And for a longer time. So that's a great idea. Now what happens in that period or in a year where you've had laid off, you lost your job or your business is poorly, you have no income or low income. So what many people make this huge mistake, I wanna pay the least tax that year. That's dumb. You want to pay the least tax over your lifetime. So when you have that opportunity and you see you have low income and you can expect later to have more normal income or higher rates and you start taking Social Security and getting that payment, your RMDs come in, your tax rate may be higher than you think, then you should convert a traditional IRA uh, or a 401k if you can access it, to a Roth up to at least maybe the 24% bracket 
or the 26, because you may be in a much higher bracket later. So that's a great opportunity and a huge mistake that people make. They tend to focus on paying the least amount of tax in one year instead of the least amount of tax over the lifetime. It's a subject we talk about in the book. That's another good way a true wealth advisor can really add value is helping do that analysis. Well, I know you're going to give this person advice that's going to be a life changer. Uh, this person asks, uh, let me find it. Oh, 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 hang on. Well, what this person wants to know is, should they roll over their 401k to a financial advisor? <laughs> well, let me say it uh, this way. First of all, you generally are better off rolling over your 401k to a self-directed IRA. So you get control. There are good 401k plans if they let you stay in them that have very low cost funds, things like Vanguard index funds or DFA funds or other that we use. And there's a list of recommended vehicles in the book. But obviously, if you get control, then you may have better, lower cost options. In some cases, though, company may have, for example, DFA's products. And you, if you don't have an advisor and feel you don't need one, you won't be able to access them in your, in your self-directed plan. So you might be better off in there. But lots of 401k plans, especially those run by insurance companies, are really poorly designed, high expense products. Is there because they're run by these, you know, banks or insurance companies. So number one, generally I tell people get control, roll it over, but it's not always the case. So that's number one. Number two, you then have the question, should you turn it over to an advisor? There's a chapter on my, in the book on how to choose an advisor uh, and it should I, we don't really have time to go into all yeah. this, but I would say this. Uh, read the chapter in the book. It will tell you the questions to ask. Make sure they answer. The rules should be this. No active investing. They, they are happy to show you that they are a fiduciary. Uh, that means they have to give advice solely in your interest. No fees paid by anyone other than you. They put their money where their mouth is. If they're not willing to show you their Schwab or other brokerage statement run. And so you can see that they're investing in exactly the same vehicles that they are recommending to you. Now the asset allocation could be very different because they're a different person than you, but they should be in the same vehicles and they should be a true wealth advisor who advises on the full spectrum because you have to integrate tax planning, insurance, the ability to rebalance and how that impacts your tax situation in that year, estate planning. And we just talked about Roth IRAs and which is the best 529 plan maybe to fund for your grandkids, all kinds of other issues like when to take social security. I will tell you, you know, people on this call, we probably spend far less time on investments with our clients and we advise on over 60 billion than we do on all the other issues. It's not even close because once we have the investment strategy set, it's simple, we're, we're passive, we just buy, hold, rebalance and tax manage for you. But then we spend all of our time helping you on all these other issues, including you know, educating your kids, helping write a family wealth mission statement, uh, helping elder care, and how do you take care of the, you know, your parents and looking at long-term health, whatever those issues are. So here's a, an email I got knowing you were going to be on, and I like this question. Uh, uh, it has to do with the choices they have uh, in their 401k uh, are not very good choices. Yeah. And, uh, now, as good fortune has it, uh, I think they do have a in-service transfer capability. Most people don't even know what an in-service transfer is, and I don't know why, but the uh, administrators of 401k plans rarely tell people what that's about. Uh, 
Right. But, um, what advice do you give to people who do have access to an in-service transfer? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, uh, there are many bad plans, sadly, especially what insurance companies will do is walk in and say to, you know, Paul Merriman, this is your business. I'll pick up all the expenses of your retirement plan if you let me put my funds in there. And then your employees get screwed uh, because then they'll eat the expenses through the high expenses and poor returns in the fund. Paul would, in that case, be much better off telling his employees, I'm going to give you the best vehicles and, and then we're going to charge you 15 basis points a year to administer the plan. That would be a much better outcome if he didn't want to absorb those costs or couldn't do it. In terms of in-service uh, in transfers, I did it myself when I turned 65 because there were some vehicles that were not available even in my company's plan, some alternative investments that are not allowed in 401 plans. 401ks because they don't have daily liquidity. Uh, so that's a great idea. If you have that, you can do it. Typically, it's a very low cost. It might be $25 or $50. And every year you could do it once. So you do an in-service transfer. You get to then manage the assets and then start contributing again. And that means your money is there for a short time. And I would tell you, choose the lowest cost, if whatever the... If they have index funds, choose them. If not, choose the active funds with the lowest cost and also lowest turnover. And you also should use bond funds because bonds belong in the tax advantage accounts. Your equities, if you have a, 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 a choice to put them in either, they're better in taxable accounts because they're more tax efficient. And bond funds are generally much cheaper than equities, even for active. So you can minimize the costs uh, that way as well. So those are some good ideas uh, to help minimize those costs. And um, oh, I actually forgot what I was going to ask. Damn, that happens way too often recently. Well, yeah, but well, we all have that problem, Paul, at our age. <laughs> uh, let's see, because we're we're I know we're coming up to the six o'clock hour. And I know I've got some, uh, oh yes. Would you please talk about long-term care insurance? Yep, great. So here's, we, want, we, need, we buy insurance for things that are too expensive for us to bear the risks. And long-term care is a great idea. Unfortunately, it's so expensive for most people uh, that it's just not viable. Now, when the product first came out, there was a rush by the insurance industries to get market share quickly and they underpriced the risks. And now of course people are living longer with big advances in medical care. And so if you have a good plan, uh, you may wanna keep it, but at the same time, most people wouldn't buy what's available today. There are better options now though which I think a really good product that started to be made available is combining life insurance with long-term care. So you buy a life insurance policy and now you're later in years and you're, you need long-term care, you have some health bad issues, you can draw down the cash value of the life insurance policy to pay that and then you probably don't need the life insurance anymore. You're going to die, and now you're later in years. But that cash is available to you. And let's say you had a million-dollar policy. You spent 500000 on long-term care. You die. Then your heirs get the 500000 But they you know, would draw down on your estate anyway. So this is a unique idea, which I think is, at least has merit for people to consider if you have to buy life insurance for other reasons, you might combine it with a long-term care policy. So, but I would tell you, you want to work with an insurance expert. Uh, we work with insurance brokers. I would not work with anyone who worked for a company who's getting paid commissions. Uh, there's a great firm we work with. We have, they analyze the best policy and recommend whatever is the most appropriate. Uh, slightly off topic, but I thought it worth mentioning because most people are totally unaware of this, Paul. There's something called a MIGA, 
which is MYGA, which is Maximum Year Guaranteed Annuity. What it really is, is it's basically a CD, but it's sold by an insurance company and it's in a annuity wrapper. So it's sold as an annuity, but it acts just like a CD. Now, most of the time, people have been better off being in bank CDs, but the interest rates collapsed and the insurance companies have found they can offer higher rates. So to, I have bought a, about 10 different of these MIGAs because I want to stay within the state insurance limit. In my state, it's 250000 So if the annuity goes bankrupt and I'm you know, then out of luck, uh, I would like the equivalent of FDIC insurance. The state has an insurance fund that would step in and pay the annuity. Today, uh, you can buy a five-year CD, I don't know, 1%, one and a quarter, one and a half. You can buy a five-year MIGA at about 275. So if you don't need the liquidity and they're totally illiquid and you're willing to go through the paperwork, uh, this is a good alternative. Again, I work with a, a broker who handles all the paperwork for me. So the first time you got to fill out all these forms and after that, they do it all electronically for you. And I just electronically sign a bunch of forms. But for people who are, are in this no yield environment, MIGAs are an interesting product. Just stay within the state limit. I'd also recommend stick with a company that's at least A rated. Um, and uh, that's what, and you can go online, just type in MYGA or maximum year guarantee, and you'll find all kinds of lists online. That's Great way to pick up an extra 1% or so, uh, as long as you don't need that liquidity. I did think, uh, I remember now what that uh, question was, social security, is yeah. that a bond? Would a person consider social security as a fixed income portion of yeah. their asset allocation or not? It's a great question. Uh, you could do that. The problem is, how do you put a value on that bond? You have to use a discount rate and the interest rates change all the time. If you assume interest rates are 2%, you take your social security and times it by 50. If you get a interest rate, a discount rate of 4%, now you only multiply it by 25. So I think that's not a good way for most people to deal with it. The way that's easy to deal with Social Security is to think of it as a bond. It's a fixed income that allows you to maybe take more risk on equities if you like. But here's how I tell people to think about it. Let's say you decide you need to spend $80,000 a year or that's what you'd like to have in retirement. And you run your Social Security numbers and you find between you and your wife, you're gonna get 50,000 a year. So now your need is 30,000. That's the number that you target. And if you use a 3% rule, you can multiply that by 33. And now I need $933,000 or whatever that number is. And that's the way to deal with it. Instead of taking the 80,000 and multiplying it by say 30, and that's two and a half million, by subtracting it, reducing your need to take risk from 80 down to 30, now you only need 900,000. And then you can say, hey, 900,000, I don't need a lot of equity risk. So Social Security reduces your need to take risk. That's the way to think about it. So Larry, is that in the book? Uh, I, it, I know what, it's a good question. I don't recall if it is or not, but that's really a very simple tool. Just subtract Let's, your social security. The, the reason I'm asking is because uh, at the end of the day here, that's a lot of information to hear and maybe yeah. it didn't get down. Have you written that up somewhere in an article? Or? Yeah, uh, I've written uh, that up somewhere. I don't remember exactly where. It may even be in the book. All right, uh, All right. we'll check it out. But any then. pension, any pension that you get, uh, whether it's from your company or Social Security, the simple thing to do is just say, I need, 100,000 a year and reduce that need by that payment. 
And the good thing is Social Security adjusts for inflation. So that's a real positive. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think your book is terrific. I heartily recommend it. And um, I, I think if you go on Amazon and you click on the, to open it up, you'll see the chapter headings. And uh, I, I'm going to guess that everyone here will find at least five chapters they would like to, to see the details. And you certainly do know the details, Larry. I appreciate you coming on here so much. And uh, I, hope, I hope because, see, this is an annual thing that we do. I'm not going to require you to be here every year, but maybe every couple of years you'd come back and hit us again. Would that be a- I, I'd be more than happy to come back anytime for you, Paul. Paul's one of the great gentlemen in the world. He devotes all his time to helping people. I try to model myself after Paul, giving oh. back. Uh, and uh, let me just add one back. other comment uh, for those. One of the benefits of reading, buying, reading my books is I answer every email from everybody who's a reader of the book. All you have to do is say, I read your book, I've got a question, and I will answer your email, your questions. As a matter of fact, I think the number at, uh, uh, at the Bogleheads is 15,700 questions you've answered online. <laughs> Could I don't be. know if you've <laughs> seen that number, but that's what I read somewhere. So. Yeah, you're, you're a good guy. And thanks for all you do for investors. Uh, and uh, Jim, uh, is there anything we need to uh, uh, wrap up here other than to make sure that uh, we encourage people to come out next week for uh, somebody who is doing a job for uh, educating our children uh, unlike anybody else. And I see Doug Hastings is giving you a hands. I think we're all giving you a hand, Larry. Thank you very much. And we'll hopefully see you guys next week. Be well. Take care. Thanks, Jim.